and welcome to today's lecture on medieval art. Today we're really going to be focusing on understanding a lot of the artistic traditions of the European peoples after the fall of the Roman Empire. So we're taking a look at the map here uh, and we need to kind of recognize, you know, we're basically looking at Western and, and Central Europe um, and we need to recognize that of course, you know, the Roman Empire had fallen. We had learned about, you know, the capital of Christendom moving to the uh, east and Constantinople. We were learning about Constantine and Emperor Justinian and so on. Um, so by the time we get to the medieval period, we start to see um, the focus on a new emperor. Uh, and this emperor is going to be consecrated, a given power and given the status of being holy, by the Pope himself. So he's actually going to be known as the Holy Roman Emperor. And in this case, one of the more famous uh, rulers is going to be uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne, who was King of the Franks and also the Emperor of the Romans. And his empire is actually known as the Carolingian period. The, the state that he founds is, is known as the Carolingian Empire. We also can call him a Holy Roman Empire, even though he really was neither holy nor Roman, actually, and interesting enough. Um, and also, we are going to look at some of the uh, influence of the Muslim world um, down in the south of Spain uh, as well. Um, and, of course, we are going to look at the influence that the Vikings of Scandinavia have. Um, especially throughout the um, coastal towns of the British Isles um, and in some other parts of um, Northern Europe as well. Um, so let's get going. Of course, like I said, we want to understand these artistic traditions um, of the European people after the fall of the Roman Empire. We want to understand the chronological placement of the period following the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 4th century but preceding the Romanesque period of the 11th century, which of course is our next chapter. It's gonna be the Romanesque uh, chapter. We're gonna look at different types of art, media, and of course the respective cultures. We definitely want to appreciate the role of the Christian monks in preserving and creating art, especially during this time. Uh, we are gonna learn about their unique role in the sense of how they actually um, helped and assisted the uh, common people, the everyday people, um, and especially through a lot of the hardships of the medieval world. Uh, and of course, trace influences of the different um, medieval art styles. This is important to recognize. <laughs> medieval art styles, meaning that there's really not just one particular style or one particular rule of thumb when it comes to medieval artwork. In fact, we're going to actually be focusing on a lot of the diversity uh, of medieval art. And we want to examine the secular and the religious architectural forms in the early Middle Ages. So let's kind of focus a little bit on Northern European art first. Um, and really we want to look at especially um, the different types of art respective to the cultures associated with the Merovingian kings, the Anglo-Saxons, and the Vikings. And we are going to look at all sorts of different materials and mediums. So let's start here with the Merovingians and um, the Saxons. So we have a pair of Merovingian looped fibulae. And if you remember, a fibulae is a pin that's worn uh, at the shoulder that helps hold up fabric. Um, and so you have a pair of Merovingian fibulae here, one on either, either side of the shoulders. Um, these are from France, and you can see that they pretty much are exquisite medieval examples of metal smithing. Um, we can see that in medieval art, some of the few motifs that are recurring will be things like zoomorphic imagery. Now, zoomorphic just means animal morphing or animal shape-shifting imagery. So you can see if you really look closely, you might notice a fish 
here. You might notice an eagle that has a big glowing red garnet eyeball um, and maybe some other uh, images of eagles and, and birds if you look a little more closely at the zoomorphic imagery. Also, in addition to the zoomorphic imagery would be things like interlaced or interwoven patterns. So where you're seeing this kind of interlacing um, that's kind of worked into some of the, uh, the filigree and other kinds of pattern details in the surface of um, this piece. Um, very decorative in a sense. We're going to look at the purse cover from the Sutton Who ship burial. Now this one is located off the coast in England, in Suffolk, England. And if you ever make it to the uh, British Museum, if you ever do get to visit London one day, you definitely will get to see some of this artwork, especially the purse cover from the Sutton Hoo ship burial. And actually a lot of the um, personalized items from that ship burial are housed in the collection there in the medieval rooms. Um, and all of the metal and um, the semi-precious and precious stones that you see are the original. The backing, this sort of white backing, uh, behind the purse is actually a facsimile, um, but it's presumed that the original probably would have been bone or ivory um, on the back of this, but essentially it was a purse cover, and you can see that it uses the zoomorphic imagery, the interlaced patterns. You have some interesting, you know, bilaterally symmetrical design here with the man and the um, uh, creatures or sort of beasts that almost look like lions or something like this, feline characters on either side. Of course, the duck with the eagle there. Um, definitely the interlace and the interwoven patterns. Lots of focus on ge geometric shapes um, and uh, repetition. Um, you know, the beauty of geometry and symmetry really comes into play here. This technique of cloisonne, all right, so cloisonne is a metal smithing technique where you have the artist um, basically inlaying these garnets, these stones, in between these, um, this sort of metal skeleton, if you will. And it somewhat kind of reminds me of stained glass where you might have the glass and then the lead that is kind of holding it all together. Um, and also a mix between that and even mosaic, right, where you're putting little pieces of stone or little pieces of tile side by side. So cloisonne kind of, um, you know, is a reminder of this decorative uh, approach with sort of inlaying beautiful colored stones into a, uh, a patchwork um, design, uh, in this case with a golden skeleton holding it all together. This interlaced animal style we will see utilized throughout the use of lots of different techniques. So we were seeing it with metal smithing. Uh, we're definitely going to look at it in medium, even like wood and stone as well. Um, so it's going to come in all different shapes and sizes through all different mediums. We want to notice that how the imagery includes intertwined ribbon-like designs that's called the interlacing, as well as abstract animal imagery. These designs feature and reflect the cultures of pre-Christian Northern Europe. So here is one of the replicas of a helmet that was found at the Sutton Hoo ship burial, and it's probably, more than likely, the helmet of an Anglo-Saxon leader maybe even a king, really just based off of how elaborate and specialized um, the technique really is. Only four complete helmets are known from this Anglo-Saxon England period um, at Sutton Hoo, uh, Bentley Grange, uh, Walson, and York. It was a rare find in the tombs. You can see looking at the nose, eyebrows in holes for the warrior's eyes. Can you even see a dragon with outstretched wings? 
made up by two bushy eyebrows, the nose and the mustache, I definitely can. I can definitely see that coming through. Um, you know, so again, a perfect example of this zoomorphic imagery where really if you start to connect the repetition of the geometry, perhaps you actually are seeing a dragon sort of flying over the king's face. <laughs> Okay, so the Vikings. So a Viking ship burial, uh, this is a good example of interlaced interwoven patterns carved in wood. This is the post of a ship uh, that was found in Osberg, Norway. And of course, you can see the kind of terrific and horrifying um, snarling face of this animal um, and you can kind of imagine the ship um, uh, on its way on its journey uh, with Vikings uh, to to come terrorize the coastal towns of England let's say um, in the British Isles and the ships are emerging from the fog and all of a sudden the townspeople see the face of this you know snarling animal it really would have been a horrific sight um the jowls and, and the cheek have um an exquisite example of the interlacing interwoven patterning we were talking about earlier it almost looks like a tapestry or a wicker basket even but this is all wood carving hand wood carving of course, the Viking ships are pretty special when it comes to the craftsmanship. The ships themselves actually were not very large. They weren't meant to carry a lot of supplies. Um, in fact, they were incredibly aerodynamic and very swift. Um, you can actually see a good example of sort of the aerodynamic quality of the Viking ship here at the Ship Museum in Norway, which one day I'm definitely going to make it to Norway. I, in fact, I was wanting to travel there um, this this year, actually, and with COVID, um, we weren't able to get that on the list. But maybe you know, one day soon, uh, when the vaccine comes out um, and when travel bans are lifted, I will get back on the plane and get myself to Norway. Um, but you can see the uh, the ship itself very aerodynamic. And in fact, this was an important strategy that the Vikings had. Of course, as you know, the Vikings um, were incredibly skilled when it came to organizing and colonizing parts of Europe. Um, so essentially, once they would land on the ground, um, they would uh, engage in these war tactics, right? Such as rape pillaging and burning the town. Um, and then, of course, they would organize, um, and then, of course, any supplies they would need would just be sort of plundered from the town's peoples, right? Um, they were sort of known for terrorizing right, the countrysides of Europe. Um, so they didn't need to carry a lot of supplies on their ships. And because their ships were traveling so fast, it didn't really give people on the land time to prepare. Um, for their arrival. Uh, when we kind of look at um, some of the architecture of um, Northern Europe and in Norway, we do see um, a Christian influence. We actually have excellent um, examples of these wooden churches uh, from the medieval period. I mean, they are dated to roughly 1050 common era. So these are wooden churches known as stave churches. They are you know, literally a thousand year old uh, buildings made out of wood, which makes them incredibly rare. Of course, wood is a material that's known to decay and rot you know, over time. I mean, just think about your wood porch or your wood deck at your house. How often does that have to be tended to or even you know, uh, replaced or rebuilt? Um, so the fact that these are in great condition today is just an excellent example um, of the testament to, to the skill in which they were built and also the fact that um, many of these churches are UNESCO World Heritage Sites, meaning that um, tourism 
and um, funding goes to the preservation of these structures, right, uh, over time. This is one of the portals of the state church uh, in Urn in Norway. And it's an excellent example of some early medieval Christian um, imagery where we actually see this uh, sort of feline-like beast, almost like a medieval lion. You can see the sort of decorative mane that he has. Um, and he is sort of wrestling with this um, pretty intertwined and jumbled vine in a sort of forest setting. And when we look really close, we kind of see that the end of one of these curvilinear shapes appears to actually have a serpent's head. Now, one could look at this and say, wow, we have this intertwining battle between a lion and a snake. And one could also read into this a little more in the terms of the context of medieval Christian symbolism, which was very black and white for the time period. And one might say the lion represents strength and victory and courage and uh, light and the snake in medieval Christianity sort of represented right, the serpent, uh, Satan, sin, darkness, evil, and so on. So one could say this is sort of representative of a battle between good and evil. Um, here's another great example of the state church um, there uh, in Norway that is the UNESCO World Heritage Center. All right, Hiberno-Saxon art, which roughly covers about the 6th to the 10th centuries, and we are going to see its influence on the British Isles specifically. We definitely want to look at the influence of Christianity and the ways in which indigenous art form serves the cause of Christianity. Um, now, this is interesting. We already know that when it came to the British Isles, the first peoples, we had already learned about them. If we went way back to chapter one, when we were looking at Stonehenge, we knew, you know, uh, who the first peoples were of this, uh, this region. Um, and so, you know, these indigenous art forms um, had their own cultural traditions and so on. And some of that definitely starts to bend right toward this Christian influence that we, we see um, arriving to the region. Um, we're going to describe the specific art elements and principles of design that are applied to the illuminated manuscripts, the Celtic crosses, and other holy objects. Um, observe the continuation of interlacing and abstract animal imagery. And why did art used for Christian purposes retain these qualities? Why would um, uh, Christians want to retain some of these qualities that might have come from a pre-Christian world? Um, that is an interesting thing to think about. All right, so illuminated manuscripts. From uh, Iona, Scotland, this is actually from a monastery there, the Book of Duro. Now, let's talk a little bit about the monastic life and um, the monastery's role in the making of manuscripts. Of course, we know illuminated manuscripts are incredibly decorative books that are hand-painted, that include both visual imagery and text. Uh, of course, you know, in the case of the um, manuscripts that are created at the monasteries, these are um, holy uh, texts uh, with, of a biblical nature. Um, but we do see examples of, of secular manuscripts made during the period as well. Typically, you'll see ink and egg tempera painted on parchment or sometimes vellum. Uh, and these pages are going to be stitched together. Uh, to form, you know, larger books, and these books might be uh, enclosed in a um, uh, 
beautiful casing, um, maybe with some medieval designs uh, of some sort. These monks actually were the recorders of history. So monks in the monasteries, there were scriptoriums and monks would spend a large portion of their lives in solitude and in prayer and in meditation, uh, praying to their God. And a part of this was, of course, being literate, right? reading and writing. So of course they are the recorders of history when it comes to biblical history and they are engaged in the making of this illuminated manuscript as if it almost is a sacred or holy act. Like it's an act of prayer or meditation for them to spend hours on end in a scriptorium working on their art project. Uh, so it's something to think about the kind of holy or sacred nature of a monk actually making the manuscript. The actual process itself was holy or sacred, as well as the final outcome, right? The final object. Um, this is the uh, symbol of St. Matthew. Um, oftentimes you see St. Matthew, who is one of the four evangelists, um, in you know, uh, one of the first you know, four books of the New Testament. Uh, his symbol oftentimes is a man or sometimes a winged man. Um, and if you know anything about Matthew, you knew that he was a tax collector in the, the biblical narrative. And Jesus called upon him to become one of the famous 12 apostles right, of Christ. Um, so we see basically this symbol of Matthew. We see this interlaced, interwoven pattern that's sort of in the border. Um, we see this focus on geometry. Lots of medieval right, geometric shapes and designs coming through here. The Linden's Fan Gospels are incredibly popular um, medieval manuscript from the period uh, and probably the more famous of um, the pages is the um, cross inscribed carpet page. Now it's called a carpet page because it actually does look like a carpet or like a tapestry. Um, but it was common actually that medieval manuscripts had a carpet page. Um, the carpet page really exhibits the colors and the patterns and it sort of is like the key that lays out um, a similar sort of design or hierarchy that you would see actually throughout the whole book itself. Of course, you know, the book is interesting the way one would engage with it, right? You have to turn the pages of the book. Um, and as you're on that journey turning the pages, you might notice similar patterns, similar colors that then are throughout the whole object. Um, so the carpet page really exhibits, um, you know, in a very decorative way, what is to come throughout the rest of the book in terms of its design. And of course, it's cross inscribed. So we actually see uh, what appears to be a Celtic cross, right? We have a kind of circular center here um, and kind of a cruciform shape overall. Uh, we will see sort of this shape mimicked in the actual sculptures of um, Celtic crosses um, all throughout the region. Um, this one is from North Umbria and it is tempera on vellum. And again, just imagine, you know, roughly the size of a book. The artist is <laughs> hand painting this interlaced, interwoven imagery. And quite honestly, you know, in looking at it more closely, you would actually see, you know, felines and birds and other kinds of animals from the forest um, interwoven into the, the design. And I can just imagine the dizzying effect, right, that this would have on the maker or the creator of this manuscript. Now, of course, it is egg tempera. We've been learning about egg tempera course, we're removing the yolk from the, the egg. We're actually taking 
the yolk right out of the sac, and we're using that lecithin, that binder that's in the egg yolk, we're mixing a little bit of water and the pigment itself into the mixture to make an archival paint um, that can be applied to a porous surface such as parchment or vellum, right? Lamb skin or calf skin, basically an animal skin paper. And very famous for the time period is what is referred to as medieval iron gall ink. Now, iron gall ink is very unique for the period. Um, the way that it's actually made is you take some oak galls and you take that gallotanic acid extracted from the oak galls. In fact, just the other day, I collected some of these um, and I've been in the process of making my own iron gall ink. Um, so, in fact, right now in the fall is a good time to go scouting um, your, your um, your local parks or uh, the woods to find some oak galls. The galls themselves are outgrowths that are caused by invasions of other life forms like fungi or insects. And in Missouri, I think it's a particular type of um, wasp um, that actually um, uh, invades the, the oak gall. And anyway, basically you crush these up, you extract the gallotanic acid from the insides of those. And then you're going to mix it with um, iron salts. So basically, um, you know, iron from nails, right, and vinegar. So you soak um, the nails, the iron nails, in vinegar, which kind of makes them rust, right? And you are going to mix that mixture with the oak extraction and the two, when those two things mix together chemically, um, the gallotanic acids and the iron salts, you get this instant, really deep, rich, velvety black ink known as iron gall ink. And that really is a lot of the ink that we see being used, especially um, to write the text or maybe even in the black outlines in an illuminated manuscript. Here's another page from um, the Linden's Fire and Gospels um, that includes St. Matthew himself. Um, and we can see a little bit different depiction of St. Matthew here um, compared to the Book of Duro. Um, we have St. Matthew kind of portrayed in a three-quarter view, uh, actually uh, recording the scripture. And we see him seated on this bench, which really has warped linear perspective. You know, we have to hand it to our medieval artists here. They're trying uh, to portray death, but they don't know all of the rules and the laws of linear perspective just yet. That actually won't be worked out mathematically on paper until we get to the year 1420 in Florence, Italy, with the artist Filippo Brunelleschi during the Renaissance. So we still have, you know, at, at least, you know, 700 more years to go there. 600, 700 more years to go before we're going to get to um, the mathematical laws and principles of linear perspective. But again, you've got to hand it to the medieval artists. They're trying to draw what they see while they're also stylizing imagery. You can see the symbols of St. Matthew here with the winged um, man, or oftentimes it sort of looks like an angel, right, um, uh, along with, uh, with him. And we know that he is a saint because we see the artist has chosen to depict him with a nimbus, a halo around his head. The figure peeking out from behind the curtain is actually unknown. Uh, we don't have a full description of who that character really might be. Of course, there's some theories. And the Book of Kells. This is the manuscript that is known as the National Treasure of Ireland. And it is referred to as the chief relic of the Western world. And some of the elements that make the Book of Kells so unique is just the exquisite amount of illumination in the actual man. 
manuscript. Um, a lot of these manuscripts might have a few full pages of illumination. There might be other pages of, of text. The Book of Kells, really every page is illuminated. Even the actual text itself has these beautiful historiated letters, which we're going to we're going to look at those as well. Um, and one of the more famous of the pages is the Cairo Iota, uh, Iota page. The Cairo Iota page uh, showcases the monogram initials of Christ's name. Uh, and you can sort of see it here, right, uh, in the Greek letters X, P, and I. And if you look even more closely, you'll actually notice, you know, winged angels, and you might even notice um, other animals, you know, a man's face, um, that are embedded into the, into the scene. Um, it's probably from Iona, Scotland, and the unique thing about the Book of Kells, like so many of the medieval manuscripts, is that it survived the Viking raids of the medieval world. Uh, of course, this is a time when the Vikings are raiding the, the, the coastal towns, uh, throughout the British Isles, and of course, one of the targets um, where they would crash land were the monasteries, because of course the monasteries had housing, they had food, right? Um, oftentimes, uh, the, the, the accommodations there would, would be nice, right? Um, the monks weren't particularly known as warriors. So, um, you know, Vikings terrorized these um, Christian monasteries during this time period. And these monks uh, would flee the scene, you know, when these Viking raids were happening. And oftentimes, you know, they would just snatch up whatever precious things were around them. And this included these manuscripts that they were spending their whole lives making. Um, and so it's presumed the Book of Kells you know, really was rescued by monks, you know, jamming it into their, their, um, their uh, monastic robes and jumping on a horseback and, you know, fleeing through the forests uh, for their lives. Um, you know, so interesting um, that it survives to this day. Some of the more details here of the interlace and interwoven patterns, the decorations are very stunning. Um, here's some of a small detail from that um, Cairo Iota page. Almost all the folios of the Book of Kells contain small illuminations like this decorated initial or historiated letter. So all historiated letter is is the first letter of a word gets a little more elaborate uh, ornamentation to it. Um, always sort of describe it as if you're reading a fairy tale book and in the beginning of the fairy tale book it says once upon a time and the O is historiated. You know, so if it's a story about Jack and the Beanstalk, the O might have, you know, the beanstalk growing inside of it um, with some of the characters from the story there within the letter. So historian letters sort of add to that fantastical narrative quality of, of the book um, and make it alive. Basically, it makes the letters jump off the page. It makes the letters feel animated, or in this case, historiated. Um, and of course, maybe even adds more meaning to the words themselves. All right, Celtic crosses. It's a very specific um, art elements and principles of design that are applied to Celtic crosses. So I had mentioned it's important there is more of the circular shape toward the center of a Celtic cross. This is the High Cross of Myrdak, um, and it is located in my master voice in Ireland um, at, you can see the cemetery next to the monastery. Um, high crosses are almost always erected around a monastery. Um, and in this case, we're looking at a medieval uh, cross. 
and you actually have a sense of hierarchy with the division of various registers or these horizontal bands. Um, and you can see imageries of um, Christ um, and themes of salvation um, that are uh, prolific uh, throughout this time period. Here's just a basic map. And you can see the location of a lot of important high crosses that are in Ireland. Um, most of them are located along the coast or uh, in um, higher uh, points um, throughout, throughout the region. Um, but almost all of them are located near monasteries. So <laughs> you can see um, that would be quite a fantastic journey to try to visit all of them if you ever make it to Ireland. <laughs> Okay, Visigoths. All right, the western branches of the nomadic tribes of the Germanic peoples are referred to collectively as the Goths. Uh, the Visigoth kingdom occupied what is now southwestern France and the Iberian Peninsula from the 5th to the 8th century. These tribes flourished and spread throughout the late Roman Empire and late antiquity, or what is known as the Migration Period. Um, the relations between the Romans and the Visigoths were variable, alternately warring with one another and then making treaties whenever it was convenient for them. We know how war works. War is usually about um, economics, right? It's usually about money. So if it serves you to be in a war, then countries go to war. If it doesn't serve you to be in a war and you can find some other way of, democratically of working around that, then, you know, you don't go to war. So, uh, stories of war and peace really ha have been the same since the beginning of time. <laughs> All right, so interesting enough, um, we are mentioning in the Iberian Peninsula the influence with the Visigoths. Um, and we see, for instance, with, at, with San Juan Bautista there in um, Spain, we have of course, this, you know, Christian influence. This is uh, basically a, a church dedicated to St. John the Baptist, San Juan Bautista. But because it's also in the Iberian Peninsula, we have a little bit of an Islamic influence. So we're really seeing imagery here that is combining both a Christian and a, a Muslim uh, architectural influence. And this is with the horseshoe arch shape um, at the entrance of the doorway. Uh, we also see that horseshoe arch showing up again here in this illuminated manuscript um, from the commentary on the apocalypse um, by Emeritus. Uh, and what we see are Christian monks in a scriptorium recording text and illuminated manuscript. And then we see this tower with one of the, um, maybe choir boy or something like this, who's pulling on the bells, the strings and the chains of the bells um, here. And so again, we have a kind of Christian imagery that's combining some of this interesting horseshoe arch or sort of keyhole-like shapes and influences from, um, from uh, Islamic art and architecture. Um, so we have a kind of a fusion and an influence from um, what we refer to as uh, Maz Arabic, Maz Arabic influence. So it's really fascinating, actually. When you, if you travel to Spain today, you'll actually see it a lot. Um, you'll see this Catholic, you know, this Roman Catholic, right, Christian influence, and then you'll see a um, Muslim um, Islamic art architectural influence, and you'll see this sort of fusion and the kind of um, uh, exchange between the two, um, just off of, um, you know. The sharing of technology and ideas, right? Probably from those periods of uh, peace, right? Uh, um, that we were talking about earlier. All right, Carolingian art, right? From the ninth century to um, 
you know, present day France and Germany. All right, understand the political and religious influences of art and architecture during the Carolingian period. And understand the revival of learning and the art of the book as the result of Charlemagne's interests. And examine the secular and religious architectural forms of the Carolingian period. Now, Charlemagne is going to be a very important emperor for us to understand because during his reign, right, as the Holy Roman Empire, he was really interested in resurrecting Rome's power that it had back in the Greco-Roman world, right, back in the ancient world, right, in the pre-Christian world. He wanted to restore Rome's glory, right, um, but in a Christian world, right, that's so he is now the Holy Roman Emperor. And so what you see is he starts leaning in on that classical knowledge, which, you know, was from the pagan past. But, you know, his uh, focus on the arts, so he actually tried to bring together very creative minds from all over his, his kingdom, from all over um, Western and Central Europe. Uh, and, you know, people that spoke different languages, coming, coming from different cultures, um, he tried to bring those minds together to his court in Aachen in Germany and get them to basically um, collaborate. You know, and we all know great things come out of collaborating and the free exchange of ideas and um, um, uh, technologies and things like this. So. It's really unique that during this medieval time, we see this mini revival. Um, now, it's not quite a renaissance yet. It's not quite the full rebirth of the classical past that we see flourishing a couple hundred years later um, in places like Italy. But it is a glimmer of that before it happens is, is really the way you can kind of look at it. Now, a couple other things to uh, mention is that um, Charlemagne himself actually was illiterate. I mean, he was a medieval king. He was, you know, uh, trained in the art of war and, you know, power and these kinds of things. He wasn't necessarily, right, a monk dedicating his life to reading and writing in the scriptorium. However, Charlemagne actually had an interest in learning how to read and write. And he did actually practice these things in the evening. Um, so it's interesting. He had a great respect for the monastic life, as we will see um, in the um, some of the future images here. And he, in fact, spent a lot of money um, in, invested in the monasteries uh, and invested in illuminated manuscripts, right? This idea of um, the art of the book. Um, and he tried to give, right, the monasteries a lot of support, both, you know, emotionally and with the money. Now, this is going to be pretty important to recognize that the time period, the medieval time period, is categorized as a time where it's the Dark Ages. Really, in the grand scheme of things, not a lot of art was being made. There was a lot of turmoil during this time period. There was a lot of plague, you know, medieval plagues. So people just weren't in good health. Um, neither myself nor you all would wish to be alive during the medieval times. The average, you know, everyday person um, may not have even had enough food to eat. They uh, more than likely were malnourished and died, you know, very, very young. Um, didn't have health care, you know, there just wasn't a lot of um, security in place for the medieval peasants um, during this, this period of time. So you had plague, you know, poor health, things like this happening. Then, of course, politically uh, and, you know, religiously, there were schisms that were happening within the church. Um, you had religious warfare going on with the Crusades. Um, you know, especially in, in subsequent years, we're going to see that, that um, 
becomes more problematic on the economies uh, throughout Europe. And then of course, you've got, um, you know, nobody is really focused on the exchange of technology, exchanging of culture, education and the like. So the Charlemagne's revival of learning, he focuses on this idea of um, focusing on the monasteries and they were sort of like his boots on the ground, if you will. Um, and people did end up um, finding solace, you know, with uh, the, the church and relied on the church as a kind of social welfare, really, uh, during the period of time. So it was unique that Charlemagne as an emperor was um, focusing on the role of the monasteries as a way to help people, but also to sort of build the Holy Roman Empire as well. And of course, he is a medieval king. So of course, he's going to have to portray his power here with an equestrian portrait. Uh, we see um, of course, it is a bronze statue that is, um, or that was originally gilt, um, meaning that it was had gold leaf on it, um, and we can see his sort of medieval regalia there. All right, the Carolingian Renovation. So we're going to continue to look at Charlemagne's empire and how it revived Roman art and architectural forms. We were sort of already talking a little bit about why he was trying to do this, what was, what was his interest in this, um, and understand this revival of learning with the book art. So I think a perfect example would be to look at the Coronation Gospels or the Gospel Book of Charlemagne, and to look at one of the pages of St. Matthew, and you can kind of compare it to, let's say, um, Matthew from the Book of Duro or Matthew from the Lindenstein Gospels, um, from the earlier periods, and you can see that there's a little more modeling, right? There's a little more chiaroscuro, although the linear perspective is not perfect, but you have some more overlapping. You have the figure sort of embedded within a landscape. Um, the artist is sort of desiring to show a little more depth, a little more extreme foreshortening um, with the um, gesture of the face, the angle of the face, the three-quarter view. Um, you're just getting a little more sense of, of movement, right? The nimbus isn't quite um, perfectly symmetrical around the head. It's a little bit off center, kind of making you feel like um, it's, it's a little more alive or maybe has a little more movement. And of course, this is sort of more of a classical notion, right? Modeling the drapery, a little more uh, lifelike proportions or believable illusions when it comes to the body, the figure in the landscape, uh, all of these things. Now, another aspect about it that is noteworthy, since it is a coronation gospel book of the Holy Roman Empire, you're seeing that it is um, purple dyed vellum. So, uh, you know, you're taking the animal hide and you're dyeing it in the, um, you know, ink basically from the predatory sea snails, which would have woo, stuck to high heaven. Uh, and, you know, of course, even just preparing the animal hides uh, for the paper would have stuck to high heaven. So this process um, was incredibly involved, um, not to mention um, the inking and the gilding going on with the actual imagery itself. Um, and just the costly nature of purple dyed vellum. Um, then here, here is the Gospel Book of an Archbishop, um, Abel of Rheims in France, and it's also of St. Matthew, so you can kind of really just even compare these two styles, something, you know, with this classical focus on classical traditional proportions for, you know, from Charlemagne, but then we're looking at St. Matthew here, where he's recording his Gospels, almost like in a frenzy as if tomorrow's the deadline that his papers do and he's got to get it done to turn it in. <laughs> so we sort of sweating bullets here. And we don't just see chiaroscuro, we see this 
lively, gestural, you know, frenzied drapery, even those lines are sort of mimicked in the, um, the landscape, almost looks like there's a tornado coming. Um, and I just love how his little toes are sort of clenching the edge of his, um, his seat there. Yeah, so this is a great example of just how many different styles there really were during this Carolingian period, um, which I think is a sort of testament to the idea of learning or a revival of learning. We all know that everybody learns differently and in, when you're talking about learning, there's an idea of the individual, right? Individuality, individual forms of expression, and different ideas, different um, innovations just kind of being put out there on the table. Maybe not necessarily just one canon, right? Um, or one way of doing things. Although, you know, studying the history and the classical past of, of the Romans was a good idea. Um, and then innovating and elaborating. And I think that that is, you know, a great example if you're looking at the variety here between the different depictions of St. Matthew, it really shows you that medieval art was incredibly varied. All right, um, this is from the Utrecht Psalter, and this one's also from France. And the Utrecht Psalter contains rustic capitals um, along with images that are depicted from the Book of Psalms. Um, and so this is just one page from that text. You can see it has um, a dark red ink on the vellum paper. And Again, you get that gestural feeling. Okay, Charlemagne's court, examining the gold and the jeweled secular and religious court uh, under Charlemagne and his successors. So, of course, you know, biblical here, we've got the crucifixion um, that was the front cover of the Lindau Gospels. Um, and so, again, sort of imagine this as a front cover to a book, um, incredibly elaborate bejeweled uh, with um, inlays of precious and semi-precious stones. Um, Christ, you know, on the, the cross here, uh, very sort of stoic, you know, sort of depicting strength, you know, not really a suffering Christ, but a Christ um, that uh, represents strength. We are going to look at, or we have been looking at images of Christ um, with more of a, a suffering component that's sort of meant to tap into a different kind of emotion. Um, so again, the changing image of Christ throughout the medieval time is, is something that's noteworthy as well. This is the interior of the Palatin Chapel of Charlemagne. There is court in Aachen in Germany. And there is his throne, um, King, King of the Franks, Holy Roman Empire, right? The em Emperor of the Romans, Charlemagne. Uh, and the subsequent German kings, you know, after, after him in the Aachen Cathedral. Uh, I think the interior of the Palatine Chapel really exhibits, a, you know, a great example of medieval architecture of the period. You can see the Roman arches come back into play. You can see the um, uh, Greek influence with the Corinthian capitals there. But then you have this um, medieval checkered pattern with the dark and light uh, marble um, that shows up um, that really is sort of actually a dark purple. It's that porphyry marble with the white veined marble. Um, even just the medieval chandelier. Um, I mean, it really looks like something from Game of Thrones. <laughs> and of course, the Palatine Chapel itself is famous because it does utilize a central plan. Okay. Systematic plan for a monastery in St. Gall. All right, so the monastery here in Switzerland, um, I, we were talking about the monastic life earlier, and we were talking about, you know, the monasteries were reserved explicitly for, you know, the clergy, especially the cloisters, um, these enclosed courtyards, where the monks would pray and meditate and spend... Um, a lot of their time, right, um, 
dedicated to uh, to God and to their God. And so the idea of these like sacred spaces like a cloister um, were you know, incredibly important in monastic life. Um, I do want to go ahead and mention, um, you know, famous uh, monasteries like, um, you know, the, uh, the monasteries of, you know, the Benedictine monks. Um, St. Benedict um, decided to form communal association in an abbey, and the head monk uh, of you know, an abbey is known as an abbot. So he, the abbot is the one who's sort of keeping everybody, you know, disciplined and making sure they're, they're, they're praying and that they're doing God's work and so on. And the head nun of, of an, an abbey would be an abbess. And she's also, you know, the one uh, sort of captaining the, the, um, the nunnery. In the case of a monastery, dedicated to, you know, by St. Benedict. The Benedictine monks were really unique because they came up with this rule. It's called the Benedictine rule. And what they believed in was um, to pray and to work. Meaning that they didn't just spend all this time in meditation and prayer in a cloister, that they actually believed in manual labor. So, you know, they focused on things like chopping wood and growing vegetables and t tending to the crops and, you know, tilling the land and, you know, um, just doing manual labor, the manual labor that one would need to do to maintain, um, in this case, their monastery, really. And they saw that, or they spoke to this in the Benedictine rule, that manual labor was a form of meditation, was a form of prayer. And that they found that that was also a part of God's work. And so they didn't just do this at the monastery, they actually went out into the, uh, the towns. And, you know, it was a part of helping the everyday people. Um, and this became incredibly important because it changed the way that people viewed work ethic in the medieval world. Typically, this idea of manual labor and being dirty and working all day in the field um, was something that was associated with poor people, it was associated with the peasant, right? And there was a kind of um, negativity that was um, sort of cast on, on work ethic by, let's say, the more fortunate people, right? And Charlemagne sort of changed that when he uh, started to focus on the monasteries and he started to give a voice to the monastic life. And also St. Benedict changed that when he focused on the idea of work, you know, manual work, manual labor, being a form of prayer. And so this actually, in a way, um, you know, called to attention the idea that manual work and, and work ethic actually was or could be one exercising their, um, their love for God or their um, a form of prayer uh, through, this, through this idea of meditation through work. Um, so the whole view concept of work ethic changes during this period of time. I sort of inserted these images into the chapter because I thought they were great examples of medieval tapestries uh, from our trip to Paris. Um, and they are some of the more famous of the tapestries. They're known as the Lady and the Unicorn Tapestries. And there are six of them. They're actually woven in Flanders. They're made of wool and silk and the designs were drawn out in Paris. And they're there um, at the um, uh, Musée National de Moyen Âge in Paris. Um, five of the tapestries are interpreted as depicting the five senses, taste, hearing, sight, smell, and touch. And then the sixth tapestry 
is that of the sixth sense. Uh, it's called my soul desire or my one desire. And the sixth sense is usually represented as um, that of love and understanding. So the sixth sense is sort of goes beyond, you know, what you can hear, smell, taste, touch, uh, and comprehend with your bodily senses. And it sort of goes into that, um, the sense of the heart. Um, and for anybody out there who's an empath, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so the tapestry's meaning is kind of obscure, but it has been interpreted as a rep representing love and understanding. Each of the six tapestries depicts a noble lady with the unicorn on her left and a lion on her right, and some include a monkey in the scene. So you always see the lady with the unicorn in every, you know, one of the images. Um, and it's fascinating because really it's a great example of a medieval bestiary. And uh, the bestiaries are just, um, you know, images of fantastical mythological creatures like the unicorn or the griffin or the chimera or, you know, the dragon. Um, creatures that uh, we haven't necessarily found fossils of anywhere, but we know must have existed because they're depicted right throughout art. So we refer to those as right fantastic medieval bestiaries. So I thought this would be really great because we really haven't been talking a lot about uh, fiber arts um, and the tapestry, of course, with the you know the warp and the weft threads um, and all the dyed cloth is such an intricate art form that we shouldn't overlook. Okay, Ottonian art. Uh, from about the 10th century around Germany uh, is associated with the Ottonians, uh, the, the ruler Otto and, and his lineage, its formal origins and its later influence. Um, we're going to be looking at lots of architecture and freestanding sculpture during the Ottonian period and looking at it through the lens of kind of a compare and contrast to the Carolingian period and also their manuscripts. So um, the nave of the church of St. Syracuse in um, Germany. And we can see here, you know, we have like a second story gallery and we have a clerestory lighting. Um, the um, alternate support uh, structure uh, here with the second story gallery and so on um, allows for uh, a higher elevation. Uh, so we're seeing the interior kind of expanding and the second story gallery is going to be important for things like the choir, for things like um, displaying holy relics, which is going to become even more important um, during our next lecture with the Romanesque period because we're going to start to see this increase with pilgrimage, the spiritual journeys that Christians are going to be making where they're basically going to be traveling and you're going to be seeing kind of a Christian tourism promoted where people travel and visit various churches to visit the famous holy relics. So expanding the space to make room for more worshipers and to make room for more holy relics is going to be important. And we're seeing, of course, the increase of the elevations, which is just going to keep continuing uh, really through, through the end of our class, um, especially by the time we get to the high Gothic period. Um, this is St. Michael's at Hildesheim in Germany, and this uh, uses uh, an important church plan with, with early, you know, Christian architecture that has um, the emphasis really on um, the ambulatory and also the crypt we'll, we'll look at as well. So this is that longitudinal section of the Abbey Church. It has a double choir basilica with two transepts and a square tower at each of the crossings. You can actually see it better in the uh, aerial uh, view of the plan here. Okay, and this is the interior looking east can actually see the clerestory lighting there. You can also see the uh, medieval sort of checkered 
pattern with the dark um, purple porphyry marble with the white marble there um, on the interior design. And we're going to look at the important entrance doors um, to St. Michael's at Hildesheim when it comes to the sculpture uh, there in Germany. So these doors with the relief panels from the book of Genesis are roughly about 16 and a half feet tall. Each door is a solid cast individual single piece uh, of bronze. So I would not want to get my fingers stuck in that door jam. Uh, in incredibly heavy. I'm, I'm not even sure really how one would open this, this door. It must have been, um, you know, exquisitely constructed just with its functionality. Um, the doors show the relief images from the Bible, scenes from the book of Genesis on the left, uh, and from the life of Jesus on the right leaf. They are believed to be the first cycle of images cast in metal in Germany and are regarded as a masterpiece of attorney art. So you have, um, you know, scenes from the book of Genesis all the way through um, images to um, the life of Christ, right? So you have kind of the, you know, in the beginning and the fall of man and then the path back to salvation, right? Uh, in Christianity is the belief, the path back to salvation is through Jesus Christ. So you have this kind of journey, this story um, that plays out through these registers. Um, and again, you know, biblical in nature, but then also important because of the, um, the exquisite nature of actually casting such a large um, object in bronze. Um, also inside St. Michael's at Hildesham, we see um, very large cast bronze columns. Um, this one's 12 and a half feet tall, and this column has the reliefs that illustrate the life of Christ um, in very similar to some of the Roman columns, like the column of Trajan that we had looked at, um, where in that particular case, you were seeing the battle of you know, war playing out and sort of the, the story of the emperor and so on. Here we have a spiral relief uh, showing um, a biblical scene um, of the life of Christ, um, but it's sort of taken from this sort of Roman tradition. And in some ways, you could say, well, this Ottonian art is kind of like Carolingian art in that way, right? Um, that it's sort of hearkening back to kind of a Roman classical tradition. We've got this idea of a column with a capital that's, you know, very Greco-Roman already. Um, but, you know, now we're seeing, right, more of this emphasis on the life of Jesus. Um, we also see during Ottonian art, the focus um, more on uh, Christ's suffering. So you'll see um, more of like the suffering Christ or the, the suffering of the crucifixion, uh, which becomes more cathartic. Um, the idea of like Christ suffering on the cross for humankind's salvation versus the strong, courageous Christ who sort of doesn't show any pain as he's on the cross from the earlier period. So one could say there's sort of more of a realistic representation of what it would be like to be crucified. Um, showcasing more of like human nature and so on, more of, again, the emotionality and that cathartic experience, um, which we know is very much a classical idea. We saw during the high classical period, this many times with like the dying warriors, for instance, um, the idea of more emotionality, more realism, more catharsis, more of that theatricality um, of what it means to be human and to suffer and to die. Um, and so we see that really coming into play during the Atonian period of the sculpture. Um, this uh, was a crucifix that was commissioned by the Archbishop Guero for the Cologne Cathedral in Cologne, Germany. And it's painted wood. Um, and actually in the way it's displayed, you know, you've got the golden rays of light, you know, Jesus, King of the Jews, uh, inscribed there on top. 
And then um, it is a it is a, a wooden reliquary actually um, uh, itself. So housing sacred um, object, and it is painted wood, you know, from the year nine seventy. So again, a wooden sculpture that's lasted right over a thousand years um, is something that would be noteworthy. Okay, the Atonian Illuminated Manuscripts. We're going to notice the golden backgrounds and more of the linear figural styles in these manuscripts and how these leaders develop significant contact with the Byzantine emperors. So we are going to see some crossover influence here uh, from the west to the east, uh, you know, the Byzantine Empire in the east and the western um, uh, Roman, Holy Roman Empire, right? Um, back in Central and um, Western Europe. So this is the Uta Codex. And I know earlier I had mentioned the importance of an abbess, you know, in um, a, a nunnery, in a, in a monastery where there are nuns. Um, so the female nun is the abbess, who's the leader of the others in the monastery. And Abbess Uta is a famous abbess because she um, you know, basically was a teacher to the Octonian emperors. She um, taught the emperors how to read and write. Um, and so she was an, a teacher, an educator, as well as um, a holy, you know, woman. And she dedicated her codex, her um, illuminating manuscript, to the Virgin Mary. So we actually see Abbas Uta right here, dedicating her codex to the Virgin and the Christ child. Now we ha have been learning and we will continue to learn how the cult of the worship of the Virgin Mary becomes really important during the medieval period, you know, all the way throughout the rest of our chapter because of course the Virgin Mary is the mother of Jesus. And so she has a kind of an emotionality, um, um, you know, already this idea of the role of woman and of what it means to be a mother. And it's very fitting that the abbess, right, would dedicate her codex to, you know, the, the, the Virgin Mary. And around the medieval time, you start to see the Virgin Mary take on this role where, you know, she's referred to as the queen of heaven. You know, so she sort of sitting on the throne with Jesus Christ, who's now, you know, right, a king. And so she is sort of the queen, right? She is the mother, right, of Jesus. And so we see her sort of exalted to this status um, in, in medieval art. And we see it here in Autonian uh, imagery. And the Uta Codex, you know, it's, that's just the most famous page. That's the dedication page. But there's all sorts of other, you know, uh, examples like the crucifixion, for instance, is the crucifixion page, and um, you know you're seeing that that geometric pattern and style, also that influence of the gold, the you know the Byzantine gold that we had been looking at. Um, some other examples here. Um, this is from um, the lectionary of Henry II. This is the Annunciation to the Shepherds. Um, Annunciation scenes uh, also were kind of scenes where, um, you know, in the Bible where heaven and earth collide or they sort of reveal, you know, uh, themselves to one another, the ethereal world, the heavenly realm sort of opens up. Um, this is Annunciation to the Shepherds. There's, of course, the Annunciation to the Virgin. We had learned about the Transfiguration. There are certain moments in the Bible where basically the skies of heaven open up and the you know, ethereal world is sort of revealed to uh, the um, everyday mundane, you know, world of planet Earth. <laughs> so, of course, we've got gold there in the sky. And then, of course, what would the Ottonian period be without uh, Otto himself? So this is Otto III, who is another Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and nominally ruled over territories corresponding to modern day Germany, France, and Northern Italy. And of course, the titles of the Holy Roman Emperor would date back to, to Charlemagne. So here, of course, he is the Holy Roman Emperor. He's neither holy 
nor Roman, but he has emblems of, of power that would be associated with the emperor, right? He has um, the orb, you know, and the staff, or the rod and the ring, and in this case, the orb of the world has the crucifix on it, and, uh, you know, so he's sort of been given this divine right to rule. Uh, of course, we see other emblems of right emperors, for instance, the purple robes, the golden bejeweled crowns, and so on. He's sort of surrounded by the clergy, right, because he's been, you know, ordained by, you know, the Pope. And then we also see, um, you know, the kind of uh, uh, political and militaristic um, side as well. Um, so he has basically supreme power as, as an emperor. Okay, guys, I think that really concludes the chapter for us uh, today. And I had a lot of fun with you all, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.